Hello, I'm Polly Russell, lead curator of Unfinished Business, the Fight for Women's Rights exhibition here at the British Library. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event. This event is such an important part of the programme. If there's one thing that feminism has to learn right now, it is to listen to this conversation about the role of anti-racism in the fight for gender equality. And I am so happy to welcome the award-winning science journalist, Dr. Angela Saini, and her guests, the Cambridge scholar, Priyamvada Gopal, author and podcaster, Leila Saad, and one of America's best-loved poets, Nikki Giovanni. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion, including everyone watching via the Living Knowledge Network. I'm Angela Saini. I'm a science journalist, and my two most recent books challenge false stereotypes around gender and race. This event accompanies, um, as Polly's just explained, the British uh, Library's new exhibition, Unfinished Business, which I encourage you all to see. Um, there is a long way to go for feminism, but it's a road that's made even longer when we fail to accept that equality is not just for some, it's for everyone. And historically, women of colour and Indigenous women have been marginalised sometimes by women's movements in the West that have prioritised certain needs and narratives that have spoken about women as one group, but in reality have treated some women as secondary. Reconciling this gulf and building a movement that includes rather than excludes then is the unfinished business that we're going to be talking about today. And to do that, I am absolutely honored to be joined by three truly remarkable thinkers and writers. Nikki Giovanni is among America's most brilliant and influential poets and one of Oprah Winfrey's 25 living legends. She's a university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech and her many awards include the first Rosa Parks Woman of Courage Award and the Carl Sandburg Literary Award. Her latest collection is called Make Me Rain. Leila Saad is a writer and podcast host who many of you will know by her best-selling book, Me and White Supremacy. The book followed a digital workbook of the same name, which was downloaded by close to 90,000 people globally within just six months. As an East African, Arab, British, Black, Muslim woman who grew up in the West, Leila sits at this beautiful intersection of identities. Priyamvada Gopal is Professor of Postcolonial Studies at the University of Cambridge. Her recent book, Insurgent Empire, Anti-Colonial Resistance and British Descent, examines the rich traditions of challenging colonial rule. Her dossier of white hot hatred collected responses to the online debate this year around Black Lives Matter. So welcome to you all. I'm, I just couldn't be happier to have such a wonderful panel with me. Now, for the audience, there will be a good chunk of time at the end for you uh, to ask your questions. You can submit them um, via, the ch via, via the question function, which is um, at the bottom of the screen. But first, um, I want to kind of address uh, the elephant in the room, really. We're coming to the end of this truly extraordinary year in so many ways. Um, but for Nikki, I want to ask you, um, about the George Floyd killing and the global outpouring of support and action that we've seen around Black Lives Matter. Do you feel this has changed the conversation? What has it been like for you? Well, I don't think I've changed the conversation. I think Black Lives Matter. The three women who were in fact uh, talking to each other, uh, which I don't understand. They don't let me discuss, they don't let me touch any of these machines, but they were uh, texting, I think it was, or emailing each other. And one wrote to the other and said, you know, Black Lives Matter. And somebody realized, oh, we, we, need, to, we need to use that. And they did. And of course the murder of uh, uh, George Floyd uh, did go all around the world. But if we go back some 50 years, a little bit more than 50 years, the murder of Emmett Till went around the world. And a woman named Rosa Parks said, no, I'm not going to give up my seat. And that went around the world. So I think Black American women have done our fair share. It doesn't mean that we're sitting down and not doing anything else. It just means that we are continuing to fight um, against the, um, for lack of a better word, the cowardness of, of what is being called white supremacy, because there's nothing supreme about having to kill people in order to, to hold your position. There's just nothing... There's nothing supreme about that. It's it's coward. Uh, they are they are cowardly. 
Donald Trump, of course, is, is one of the big cowards of the world. And we can go back just a few years. Hitler was one of the big cowards in, in, in terms of Germany, Mussolini, because when you have to kill people in order to hold your position, it's a cowardly situation. And I think uh, as a, 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 and a song by Aretha Franklin says, let's call this song exactly what it is. I think it's time that we call them exactly what they are. There's nothing supreme about being white. There's something very cowardly about it. And um, I mean, one of the themes of t- today's event is also feminism and patriarchy. In what ways then does patriarchy and racism then meet and, and affect people's lives uniquely? You're asking me? Yes. Yeah, Nikki, sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've got three, three brilliant panelists here and, and uh, I wasn't sure. I think that there's nothing as dumb as patriarchy. And I think that the animal world from which we have evolved knows it best, that there's a season that we have, and it's called mating. And women recognize, okay, it's mating season, whether you are a penguin or whether you are a robin or whether you are whatever you are, uh, uh, whatever you are, there's a mating season. And you mate and the women go and have the children, have the babies, have whatever they do. And the men just go away, which is pretty much what they should do. The best father on earth, of course, is Father Penguin because he's the one that takes care When she lays the egg, he's the one that picks up the egg and puts it in and keeps it warm. He doesn't know if that egg was the one that he had anything to do with or not. He doesn't know if the egg is alive or not. But during that whole gestation period, he's the one that keeps it alive. And he hopes that when the time comes, that egg will will, will be alive, it will be open. And I think that, that humans ought to learn something from Father Penguin, because I think Otherwise, humans are, are going to do the kind of thing that they do. They end up beating their wives. Look, look what men do to, to women. They beat their wives. The wives say, well, I don't want to be beaten anymore. I've been living with you for all these years. It's not going to happen. And they say, well, if you leave me, I'll kill you, as if that makes sense. And we've seen the whites, white men get in their automobiles, as they did in Charlottesville, and run their car into a group of white women and murder white women. We've seen them in one of the most awful murders, a woman named, uh, which a lot of people don't know, Viola Louisa from Detroit. And she went down when, when, when uh, John Lewis led the, the, the uh, march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. She went down to help people. She went with her car to drive back. And one of the Klansmen in the car, in a car, drove up beside her. They knew that she was a white woman. There's no mistake in her. And pulled out his gun and shot her in the head. He, he murdered her. And so when people talk about, you know, we're, we're white men and we really love our women, you, you got to be insane to think that that's true, because look at the way they treat them. And Layla, just coming to you, I mean, th- there are so many um, complicated intersections here when we talk about patriarchy and white supremacy. Um, for you, then, how does this... Um, how does this confound social justice? How, how do we build social justice movements that take into account all these different factors that make people vulnerable in so many different ways? I think, um, you know, patriarchy and, and white supremacy are absolutely interconnected. Um, I was recently, just before we started the panel, I, I told you all I was reading Ruby Hammett's new book, um, which is brilliant, and I really recommend everyone go to read it, but it really helped me understand the historical context of the way that white supremacy has been constructed to specifically uphold and maintain white male power, and that everyone else, whether it's white women, black women, uh, black people, indigenous people, people of color, are pawns in that game to keep white male power in power. And so in order to you know, deconstruct, dis- dismantle white supremacy, we have to also look at patriarchy. And of course, you know, Bell Hooks has always talked about the interconnection of all of these systems together, right? Capitalism, white supremacy, um, patriarchy, imperialism, they are all linked together. And, you know, this year I've been researching and writing the Young Readers edition of Me and White Supremacy. And so this is a, a book that is for 10 to 14 year olds. And unlike us adults, they don't have necessarily the context of colonialism. They don't have the context of where all of these racist ideas come from. And so when you look at the history of colonialism, the way that white people, specifically white males, white men, colonized the world and the reasons that they did it for and the ways in which they did it, you cannot separate 
patriarchy from white supremacy. They are they are interlinked. interlinked. Um, and and so you know, even when we think about feminism, so I talk about white feminism in the book. Even white feminism is about upholding white patriarchy or trying to come into a sense of equality with white patriarchy. And so unless we are able to look at these clearly, we will keep replicating the same systems again and again and again. I want to come back to you on white feminism, but I think that's a perfect point to uh, which to go to Priyamvada, because can you give us an overview then of why these things are interlinked through your understanding of colonial history? How is patriarchy and white supremacy really completely intertwined? Well, I mean, I think that any historical phenomenon um, rests on multiple axes. Um, So colonialism uh, was a a project which was about wealth creation and profit creation, the extraction of resources, the enslavement of people, um, drawing out free labor and then making profits out of that, bringing, uh, you know, bringing resources from uh, parts of the world uh, to the metropole, to, to Europe. Um, It involved uh, um, uh, patriarchy, certainly in the ways in which it envisaged a certain kind of elite white man going out into the world and penetrating it, as it were, and making it his own. Uh, It's no accident that large parts of the world from uh, North North America to uh, Africa were presented as virgin lands uh, awaiting, in a sense, sexual possession. So the language of profit creation and the language of wealth creation, the language of patriarchy have been uh, intertwined from the start. But I think we also need to understand that uh, colonialism interacts uh, when it goes out into the world with other systems of oppression. So it interacts, for instance, in in South Asia with caste and interacts with uh, structures of feudal rule uh, in Africa. It interacts, uh, you know, with, with different kinds of collaboration in Latin America, in North America, in Asia. So the thing is that no no system can be understood as simply about race or simply about class. Race, class, gender, sexuality, caste. These things interact and they create different kinds of lethal cocktails depending on on where you are and that's that's one reason our politics can't be single issue based either because oppression is always a nexus of different kinds uh, of um, uh, if you like hierarchies. I mean also during the colonial project there was also the uh, the encounters with different um, systems of thinking about gender or sexuality what did colonialism do to that kind of I mean, did it bring a European way of thinking about gender and human difference and sexuality? I think it depends on which context you're talking about. I mean, there are certainly contexts where a particular kind of binary, uh, heterosexual uh, European patriarchy prevailed. Uh, But I think we have to be quite careful about making generalizations and saying, oh, um, the European model went out there and it replaced more progressive understandings of gender. It did in some um, it certainly narrowed the spectrum of sexuality in some places. In some places, like for instance, Kerala in South India, um, it interfered with uh, family structures and it replaced, for instance, matrilineal family structures with the Victorian family ideal. But I think we need to be careful about suggesting that there was always um, a, a kind of a conservative retrograde European presence which harmed the more progressive Uh, prior presence. Very often, uh, one kind of patriarchy, that is European patriarchy, interacted very well with other kinds of patriarchy and other kinds of sexual uh, hierarchies, and often, again, as I said, created a lethal cocktail. Certainly, the European model of family and marriage and sexuality uh, and a very Christian model influenced um, parts of the world in the colonial encounter. But again, I think it is it is rather more complex than it is sometimes made out to be. Um, Leila, then coming to you, uh, in the history of Western feminism or feminism feminisms within the West, um, there are there have been splits. There have been issues here, particularly. I mean, if you look at the suffrage movement in the U.S. in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, sometimes it was very racist. There were 
um, even some of the pioneers of the of the suffrage movement, like Susan B. Anthony, were willing to throw black men and black women, therefore, under the bus for their own rights. Yes, and it's actually, you know, it's, uh, an African American topic that is referred to to Nikki you have that greater context. But what I will say um, with regards to how that plays out globally, you know, it's not just it's not just an an American issue where that happens. You know, this idea of that there is one single feminism that we're all working together, that we're all facing this one single type of patriarchy. That many white women who don't want to look at racism and white supremacy and their part in it would like us, women of color, and black women to sort of have a sense of amnesia about our history with them and with the world. And to say, yes, we put our race aside. Um, we don't want to identify with any other part of ourselves except our gender in order to be with you in this struggle. And, you know, I will never not be a black woman and I will never describe myself as a woman black. I'm a black woman and that will always be my identity. You cannot separate them from one another. And I think one of the greatest frustrations for us in this time, but also for women of color, indigenous women, black women throughout history has been this idea that we can do that or that we, or that if we were to do that, that we would be treated the way that they are treated, both by them and by white men. And so um, it, it's important to understand that while there are these ways in which we are impacted by patriarchy in similar ways, having white privilege will always be a source of protection and ease and safety that women of color will never have. And, and do you think there is uh, an acceptance within um, white women in the feminist movement now, given Black Lives Matter, that this is something that they do need to address? Do you, do you feel more included in the movement now than perhaps previously? Um, I don't necessarily seek to be included in the movement. Um, it's not something that I um, feel like I should be, you know, that a little space should be made for me to squeeze myself into. I think that Black women and women of colour have always been fighting for all rights, right? And that the least among us, those who are experiencing the most oppression, if we are liberated, if we have freedom, then everybody has freedom. So I don't, I, I definitely see that there are more white women who are more willing to look at the intersections of all of these identities. But by the same token, I think that there are many white women who want to pay lip service to that concept, but don't really wanna do the work to look at themselves first and their place in this. They are more comfortable talking about this theoretically or intellectualizing about it or talking about it as a concept, but not looking at how it impacts them in their life and therefore how they are impacting the people of color in their own lives. Nikki, what are your thoughts on what Leila has just said? <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it's very interesting. Um, I am very proud of Black Lives Matter and I'm not a feminist and, and I hope that I wasn't invited here under that sort of rubric that, that somebody says, oh, I think Nikki's a feminist, I'm not. And I mentioned Viola Luizzo because I appreciated the fact that she left her family and came down from Detroit and helped with, this, with the freedom movement. She helped with, with John Lewis. She gave up, of course, her life, we know that. We know that other white women have been murdered. We know that there is a whole story about, I, I'm here in Appalachia, and we know that there's a story of white women in Appalachia who put their quilts out in their homes so that the escaping slaves could follow the trail. I'm living actually within walking distance of the Appalachian Trail. And that's that's good. I, I guess my problem with this whole thing is I, I'm so tired of talking about white people. I think it's mm -hmm. time that we started to, to think about what is it, what is it that we that we want done? What is it that I want in my life? What is it that, that we as black women want in our, in our lives? And I think that, that a, a lot of that has to be discussed because we're always discussing what white men have done. Well, if you don't know that they're cowards and fools, I don't know when you're gonna learn it. So I can't teach it to you. So what I wanna do is say to, if I had, which I don't, a daughter, I would say to her, you know, you have to be free. That's, that's what's important. Not, you, you're not, never gonna free them. 
when, when Donald Trump was uh, stole, he didn't, yeah, I was about to say, elect, but he wasn't elected. The Russians stole that election. When that happened, I received a phone call from one of the major newspapers. And they said, what would you like to say to Donald Trump? And I said, not a damn thing. Why am I going to talk to Donald Trump? I know he's the devil. I am a Christian, so I'm going to agree with Jesus on this one. Get thee behind me, Satan. I got nothing to say to Donald Trump. I'd be a fool to think that I can say something that's going to make him change his mind or learn something. I am not Ice Cube, who should be and probably is at this point, incredibly embarrassed that he went up saying, I have a plan that I want to share with Donald Trump for Black Americans. What kind of sense does that make? We live on a small planet. It's a round planet. We're third planet from the yellow sun. And I think that that's, that's the kind of thing that sort of needs to be, we need to be treating, we need to be teaching people that all we are is earthlings. And if we're lucky, we're gonna evolve. If right now I was talking about what my $5 would do, but my bet is that, that humans are on their way out. We, 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 it, it's a waste. And if, if, if there would be a God, whether you believe or not, I'm not into that. And my, if my phone rang right now and it was God, and Nick is God, and I just want to, you know, get your opinion. You, you think we should continue with, 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 with human beings or not? I'd have to honestly say, God, I, I think you tried, but it hasn't worked. So close it down and let's see if we can go to another galaxy. Let's see if we can do something else because this isn't working. And we can talk about it. We can write about it. And it's a lot of things that are interesting, but it's not working. As long as we continue to have as our focus what white men who we do recognize as cowards, we do recognize exactly what they are, but nobody wants to say that. We do recognize, and I mentioned Trump because Trump is such an evil son of a bitch. We do recognize that he is a traitor to this country. Nobody wants to call him a traitor. Everybody wants to say, oh, he doesn't understand. Donald Trump has sold this nation out. We recognize that there are other people, other places who cannot walk out into the street without covering their faces because we say, well, the men can't, you know, you have to cover your face. You have to cover your hair. We just can't let you go, go walking out in the street because men get excited. If men don't know what to do with their penises, that's not my problem. That's their problem. Well, I just want to remind the audience at this point that um, you can submit questions um, ahead of time. And in fact, I encourage you to do it. If whatever you're hearing is um, provoking you to think, like it's provoking me to think, then please um, type in your questions and send them along. Um, I, I want to come to you, Priyam Vada, to, uh, I mean, the irony from what Nikki was talking about, the irony of having in some Western countries these leaders who are so clearly uh, damaging for women who do um, damaging for women and damaging for the cause of anti-racism um, and yet often equality is framed as this kind of western ideal to be res to be exported to the rest of the world how do we reconcile these things well I mean equality is um, a human impulse equality is something that all cultures have theorized whether in the form of a dominant idea or whether in the form of resistance um, equality is absolutely not a Western idea. Western societies are by no means equal, um, not just in gender terms, but in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of religion, uh, in terms of you know, sexuality. These are not equal societies. Um, so it's kind of absurd to present equality as a Western idea. Um, all societies have tyrannies and all societies have subversive resistance practices which are about justice and equality. So in, in my life, um, you know, whether as, uh, as a feminist or whether as an anti-racist, um, and indeed as someone who uh, uh, challenges caste hierarchies, um, I've never seen this as something that I learned from the West. Um, there are plenty of uh, traditions on the Indian subcontinent to which I can affiliate, as, as Nikki just said, we don't have to constantly be looking or doing our what we do in relation to what, what white men do or don't do. I, th I think that is, uh, that is correct. Um, at the same time, I think it is quite important to recognize that cultures interact and that there are no sharp boundaries between cultures. And what I talked about in Insurgent Empire, my most recent book, is the ways in which you know, practitioners of equality from, free, from slaves to abolitionists to white abolitionists influenced each other. 
and learned about equality from each other and inspired each other to fight for equality. So I'm quite interested in both non-Western traditions of justice and equality, but also the ways in which cultures interact and learn from each other in a global frame. I would also say here one thing, which is that, yes, um, the white man as, a, uh, as an abstraction uh, is a coward, is a, uh, uh, an, an oppressor, but equally all societies and all uh, cultures have other kinds of identification. And we do need to be careful to understand that the, the white man who dominates in the form of someone like Donald Trump or Boris Johnson is a particular kind of white man from a particular kind of class background, from a particular kind of wealth uh, formation from a particular kind of very disgusting form of heterocentric uh, patriarchy. Um, so, you know, as a, as a, as a, any an Indian woman from an upper caste Brahmin background, I have to also the gaze, the critical gaze that I cast upon white men. I have to turn back upon my own formation and upon Brahmin men, from the tyrannies and um, injustices that belong to the societies that I come from. So I think, I think, you know, we do need to slightly perhaps complicate the picture of both tyranny and resistance and equality, because these are things that uh, are not owned by any single culture. And we have to find, kind of find a way of uh, framing them in alliances with other people. Wonderful. And oh. Leila, coming to you now. Um, I mean, you have your feet in so many different worlds. And I just want to, I mean, sometimes it can feel, especially for me living in London right now in Britain, it can feel that a lot of energy is poured into um, tackling things like the gender pay gap here and, you know, the, the issues that we are facing on the ground in Britain. But of course, women all over the world are facing so many of their own battles, not least in the Middle East. Um, do you think that there is enough recognition of that and solidarity between nations uh, when it comes to these social justice movements? Um, I, I, I guess I wanna echo what um, um, Priya has just talked about in terms of, you know, it, it, it's complicated and cultures are interacting with each other in these different ways. But I guess what I'm really struck by oftentimes is this idea that Western culture Western news, Western context is the blueprint that is then put onto every other culture that we need to compare it to. And, you know, when so much of the news is dominated, for example, right now with the elections in the US, there's so much other news going on around the world that is equally of importance, that is equally impacting um, people of all races and genders in, in various different ways. And so, um, you know, I, I think as somebody who has a very, multicultural or uh, kind of background, I have this, I often am able to sort of zoom out and both zoom back in and see the interconnections between these different, um, you know, variabilities, but also see how each one is unique in its own context. You know, you can't, for example, inter, like you can't compare the movement for women and feminist movement feminisms in the Middle East to Western feminisms. They come from different contexts. They are fighting different forms of oppression. They may, be diff they may be the same, generally speaking, but they have different histories. And so one of my biggest frustrations I know has been this idea of um, when people don't necessarily know that I'm a Muslim and then come to find out that I am, you know, they'll use Islamophobia and the fact that I'm a, a Muslim woman and as a way to say, well, you're oppressed or, well, you don't know anything, you know, because you come from this oppressive background. And I'm like, you don't, you don't know anything about Muslim history and, and women's history in the Middle East um, for you to say that. But it's just a way, again, that Western history and Western culture is used as the standard that everyone else is supposed to compare themselves to. And I just, I just think it's, it's so important for people in the West to be able to understand, yes, you may be seen as culturally the superpowers of the world, um, but that was by design, right? That was created. It's not biologically true. It was created in that way. Um, and as much as you may want to say, or try and focus on all the best parts of you and say, black people, people of color, African people, indigenous people, um, are somehow behind and need to catch up. Like you designed it that way, right? And there's so much that can be learned from the feminisms outside of the Western context. 
So I, th I just think it's really important for people to not, uh, to, to really learn how to decenter whiteness in their own minds. I couldn't agree with that more. Uh, can you give me, give me one or two examples then of the, of the feminist um, movements that you see in other parts of the world doing things that um, are ins inspirational to you? Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, one of my, um, one of the reasons that I'm so involved in this kind of work is actually because of my religion, because social justice, I feel, is very baked into, justice is a part of Islam, it's what gives me the motivation, it's, what, it's where I source that power from, and when we look at Islamic history, some of the most powerful women in Islam were women, some of the most powerful people, sorry, in Islam were women, and I, and I get, um, you know, the way that white supremacy creates Muslim women is as oppressed, is as, you know, they don't have a voice, they can't say anything, they don't know how to do anything. But in fact, our history tells the complete opposite of that. And so being able to learn context outside of outside of a Western context, I think is just is just really, really important. Um, Nikki, just coming to you then, you, you said earlier that you're Christian. Does your faith also inform the way that you feel about these? <laughs> We're hearing. I, have to apologize for my I think there's, <laughs> there's somebody else in that room who wants to have a voice <laughs> as well. So then co coming to you then, Priyampada, um, how would you respond to what Layla's just said? Um, I think it's absolutely right to say that uh, struggles are very specific and just in the way in which we would not want to make an abstraction of, of the white man necessarily. Um, I think feminism, we know, uh, is, is not uh, a, a single agenda, a single kind of campaign. I mean, I, my own engagement with feminism was very much um, in the subcontinent. It was very much fueled by different kinds of um, imperatives and different kinds of uh, um, goals. Um, but what is important and interesting is that is that feminism is is not a single terrain. It's not, uh, you know, one kind of issue uh, structured around gender. So, for instance. Um, although I came of age uh, in the Indian women's movement, which is very, very vibrant, um, just as you know, liberal white feminism has had to be challenged in India, the women's movement, for all its complexity and sophistication, has been rightly challenged by Dalit women because it's very, very upper caste in tenor and in, uh, in how it presents itself. So feminism itself is, is not beyond uh, challenge and it's, ne it's never a single thing and it is constantly about contestations and struggles and about changing itself in response to changing uh, exigencies. Today, for instance, we know that just as black people uh, in the United States are uh, you know, murdered with, with a degree of impunity. We know that Dalit women in India are raped by upper caste men with a degree of impunity. And it is impossible, therefore, to say that there is a single kind of Indian feminism. It really depends on caste, class, context, uh, religion, as uh, Lila just pointed out. Uh, these things are fluid, changing, and context-bound. So I think it is quite important to uh, say what, what Lila just said, which is that we, you know, these things don't share an agenda in either space or time. So then, Priyambada, is it is it impossible to speak about one women's movement? That is it is that just a nonsense? Well, I think it is impossible to say the women's movement. I think that alliances can be made. I think there is shared common cause to be made. Any movement, whether it's on race or whether it's on gender or sexuality can only make common cause and identify common terrain. Uh, but there is no kind of prior commonality. There is no uh, single woman around whom we can go here as though that context, that was you know, self-evident. The definition of woman also changes both with space and time. And I think, as I said, we have to be, uh, all movements have to be subtle and responsive to historical changes. Nikki, what are your thoughts on this and what Leila and Priyambada have just said? I, I do apologize for my dog. She's very protective. And when anybody walks down the street, she, she gets crazy. And so I'm sorry if she's disturbed us. Uh, I was, I'm very interested. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I guess I'm very unhappy <laughs> at this um, particular time uh, in my life. I think I'm older than everybody on the panel. I'm 77. I recommend growing old. But I think that, that 
we cannot change everything and we're not going to bring everybody together to change everything. I am, I am very fond of and very proud of black American women. There, is, there has been no movement of anything that black American women have not been an, an essential part of. I think of Jane Addams, who you may or may not know, she was married to, to the Adams, And she's the one who said, and this you can look up, she's the one who said to John, don't forget about the women. So when he went down to help build the constitution, not saying anything about that, but when he went down to build the constitution, it was Jane who tried to remind him. He tried to get it in, but he didn't. But my point was, and my point is, they owned slaves because everybody owned slaves at that point. And I can't help but, but imagine that the woman in Jane Adams's kitchen, who was doing the cooking and the cleaning, Mm. was said to her, now Ms. Adams, don't forget about the women. And we have seen what black women have done and what we have continued to do. When we look at, I mentioned it earlier, not that anybody cares, but I mentioned the, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott. I mentioned Rosa Parks. It was the women who got up before dawn, who fixed lunch for the men so that they could continue the boycott without having to come back home for lunch so that they could walk to work so that they could take care of themselves. It was, it, it's always been the women and I, it was the women. And I, 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 I think it's just incredibly sad when, and there were, there were problems in, in, in the entire African continent, but we're looking at West Africa and there, there were wars that were going on. White men did not go into communities and, and, and steal black people didn't, the war, and we've done that with everybody. We, we've done that with, uh, if anybody here is a, a, a Palestinian, we've done it everybody. We have stolen people. We're doing it with the brown people now. And we steal them. And they brought those people that they stole, who's going to be actually my ancestors, and they sold them to Europeans who sold them to what's going to be Americans. But, and this was my point, it was the women who had to make that adjustment. Now the women could have gone crazy because a, a lot of people did, but black American women found a way to talk to each other because there's no language, as you all know, there is no African language. The language is, is different in, in the, on the continent of Africa as it is on the continent of Europe. So they had to find a way to talk. And it was the women, and we can't get over that, who found the song that is gonna become the spiritual. And this is how they held themselves and their community together. So I'm very fond of, of what black women have done. I am very proud that Pope Francis has decided that as he put it, love is love, has decided same sex marriage is, is fine by him. I'm very proud of him because it's time. I'm not a Roman Catholic, by the way. When I say I'm a Christian, I grew up in the Baptist church. I identify that because I live in America and if you can't identify some kind of way, then nobody knows who you are. It has nothing to do with it. I'm very proud of the most. I'm, I'm not unproud of any of it, but I'm very proud that the Pope has finally decided it's time to quit picking on same sex marriage or same sex love. And I don't know that he's doing it because what, he needs more people in the church. I don't know why, but I'm very proud that he did it. And I know that these are all steps that he's been taking. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what, we're back to, I am proud of what black Americans have done because that's all that I can really do. I know that Martin Luther King, you remember when Martin got out of jail, letter from Birmingham city jail, it's wonderful, beautiful. And you know that when he was finally released from jail, he went to India, somebody here, he went to India because he wanted to study what, what uh, 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 what's his name had done for the- uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. And he wanted to study that. And I'm glad Martin went. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. But Martin is not, he's just not me. I'm just, I'm just a poet in a small <laughs> Not just a poet. No, I mean, but no, I mean, that you have to know who you are. I, I'm not going to change the world. So if I do any bit of traveling and stuff, I'm not going to, it's, it's not going to involve me in a way that, that makes a big difference. But I know that I'm also not going to stand and watch somebody get murdered as we watched three men of various uh, uh, races, actually, murder. We watched them watch a white man murder George Floyd. 
I'm not going to stand and watch somebody get murdered. Now, that may cost me my life. I hope not. But I'm not going to do that. All I can do, though, is find the words, because that's all I, I'm just a poet. And many of us are, are, are being forced or being encouraged or something to, you know, you've got to change the whole world. You can't just do what you can do. I think all we can do is, is what we can do. That one step, those don't, 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 don't. Or as there's an old uh, African-American spiritual, it's called uh, climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher and higher. And I think that that's important. So now we're, we're getting the, the statues of the Confederates who were traitors knocked down. And I think that's, that's incredibly wonderful. I hope that we get rid of the traitor who has stolen <laughs> the White House. I hope that we take these steps. But that doesn't mean that the Western world that I grew up in is right. It just means that this is where I am. And all I can do is try to get rid of Donald Trump and, and, and Pence and, and all of those racist Nazis who have tried to, to steal our nation. But as a Black American, I know one thing, if white Americans, women and men, don't do their fair share, the nation's lost. And as a black person, I'm gonna say, well, you lost it. As I just said, if God called and said, Nikki, should we keep it? I'm gonna say no. If, if, if white people in America don't do their fair share, mm -hmm. then lose it. What, what the hell do I care? I have come through it. I have been through it. We have come through slavery. We have come through segregation. We have come through lynching. So there, there's a limit to what I'm going to do. It's time, and I am a woman, but it's time as a woman that white women stepped up. I'm, I'm, I'm sick of their whining. I, I, I look at Donald Trump, uh, those so-called rallies, and those women are there, and they're, oh, Trump, we're for Trump. Well, then goody for you. That bitch they just put on the Supreme Court. She had seven children. I don't believe in abortion. Well, I'm glad she doesn't. I do. Mm -hmm. So let her have her seven children. I don't want seven children. But all I can do is not have seven children. That, that's, that's going to be the extent. If I had a daughter, which I don't. And I would be delighted. I would be delighted to have a daughter because I think daughters are the best things in the world. And if she came to me and said, Mom, I'm expecting I don't want to have this child, she would have an abortion because there's not a black woman in America that doesn't know how to get an abortion for her daughter. Now, I don't know about anybody else in the world. <laughs> I don't, but I know if you want an abortion, find a black woman, because we all know how to get rid of anything you don't want. We can do that. We can also help you keep it and love it. It goes either way, but I'm just, I'm, I don't, I'm probably not making sense and I probably made everybody angry. No, but you know, you're making, stop you paint a very evocative picture, Nikki. And Layla, so we're going to go to questions soon, but Layla, I just want to come to you then, finally. I mean, um, Nikki paints this very evocative picture of at the birth of the American Constitution. Here is Abigail Adams telling John Adams, don't forget the women, remember the women. Do you think this is what women of color are having to do now is look to their nation and say, remember us? Uh, well, I think I think we've been saying it all along. I think we've always been insisting that we are here, that we um, deserve to live in the fullness of our humanity, that we deserve full dignity. Uh, I don't think that this has ever been something that has been a side issue. It's always been front and center. Um, so yeah, I think it, for you know, and even in in that um, in in what Nikki was sharing, you know, when that that refrain of don't forget the women, we know which women were meant by that, you know, uh, and which women were excluded from that. And yet still we have always been here insisting that we deserve to be here, we deserve to live in the, in the fullness of our humanity. And we'll continue to do so, right? I'm, I'm listening to everything that, that Nikki is, is saying and I'm, I'm so, it's just, it's bringing up so much for me because I've really been wrestling this year personally with how do you have hope in a time like this and how do you keep moving forward? And there are so many reasons to lose hope. And I definitely found myself in a place personally, in a place of hopelessness and um, kind of what, what's the point? You know, we, people have been working for so long. I have these posters behind me of some of my, you know, personal um, heroes, Maya Angelou, um, Octavia Butler, Audre Lorde, um, Toni Morrison, Nikki, you were definitely one of them. And when I told my kids that I was going to be on this panel with you, they were very, very excited for me. Um, I, you know, you, each one of you just bringing so much of your 
true self, your authentic self and sharing that with the world. And like you said, all I can do is what I can do. And I'm so glad that you are here doing what you can do. And it makes me look within myself again and again and say, what is it that I'm here to do? What is it that I'm here to bring? Um, I do have a daughter. I have two children. My firstborn is a daughter. She's uh, 11. Uh, my son is six. And one of the things that pulled me out of my personal hopelessness and despair this year is my children. Um, I, I, I owe them to keep moving forward. I owe it to them to keep helping to build a better world. I will not do it from a sense of naivety about, as Nikki said, the cowardliness of white supremacy. I will not do it from a sense of trying to convince white people that I deserve to be, uh, to, to live in the fullness of my deserve to live from that place. I will do it by speaking the truth, living as I am without apology, not waiting for anyone else to recognize my value or my worth and continuing to say, look, this is what I'm here to do. I'm a teacher, I'm not a poet. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm here to teach. I will teach you what you don't know about yourself, what you may not recognize, the history that you may not be aware of. And I will teach you techniques for looking within yourself and ways to think critically about the system of oppression that we live with that favors some people above another, privileges some people over others so that we can have a better world. But regardless of when this change happens, if it ever happens, I will always continue to live in a way that reflects the truth of who I am and what it means to be a black woman. And I will teach my children the same, whether or not white people as a collective ever fully get there. Wonderful. Thank you. It's such a pleasure listening to all three of you. So we've got lots of questions from the audience here. I just... Um, there's two that are related, one from Vihan Jain, one from Michael Sulu. And they ask, why are, in brackets, mostly white people so afraid of the words white supremacy? And how do you convince people that it's not about white people plotting the murder of people of color? And Michael Sulu's question is related to this. He writes, there is a lot of discussion around the language that is used in this area being divisive. It also seems like it is intentionally misused or misconstrued. To what extent do you believe a change in vocabulary would help progress equality or equity? I'm going to come to you first, Priyam Vada, because on social media, you've been very active and sometimes you yourself have seen your use of words being rounded upon and people attacking you um, as a result of it. How do you feel about this? Well, I mean, the to begin with the first question, um, I find that you can't even say the word white um, that that itself um, it, it creates kind of waves of shock and it's treated as problematic that you identify some, something to be connected to whiteness or white supremacy. But the reason there is such a recoil, of course, is that any system that is so powerful that it need not name itself does not like to be named because to be named is to be called out. So. While it's you know perfectly normal to talk about black people or brown people or women of color or black women, um, it's not that common for whiteness to be named, not, not just named, but also described precisely as an insidious invisible system. The real mark of power is the power to be invisible because you, you are everywhere, you need not name yourself. And that's why um, you can talk about race as much as you like and nothing happens until you start to talk about whiteness. The second question, I didn't really understand whether it was being suggested that people who are anti-racists are using divisive language and therefore they should come up with a, a different kind of vocabulary. The point is this, the divisions already exist. That's we right. live in a deeply hierarchical and conflictual racial geography. So there's no point in saying the language is divisive. The point is that the division already exists. And what the language tries to do is to identify these divisions and speak about how we might overcome them. But it's not as though the onus is on anti-racists to change their language or to tone down their uh, analysis so that those in power feel comfortable. That's not how change happens. Leila, how do you feel about that? 
Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. <laughs> I have a book called Me and White Supremacy. So I very strongly advocate calling a thing a thing and naming it for what it is. I don't see how we can even begin to understand what it is if we are afraid to name it or we are offended to name it. I think it's so important to name it for what it is, to understand what it is um, when, we under when we hear it. Um, and to, like uh, Priyambada was saying, to identify whiteness for what it is. You know, so often people want to confuse that we're talking about the literal whiteness of their skin. No, we're talking about whiteness as a construct, as a system, as an ideology, um, as, as the condition that we, that we live in. And, and we as people of color and black people know the very intricate and intimate ways that it operates both on a day-to-day -day, day -day level and an institutional level. So we are the best people to say, this is how it works. This is how I experience it day-to-day. -day. This is how I've seen it, um, it affect and impact other people. It has to be named. This idea of, on this conversation of, is it the right words or is it the right way to say it? I strongly feel is a distraction. Mm -hmm. It is a way for us to get away from doing the work that needs to be done. And Nikki, I mean, your work is words. Uh, how important is the language here? What What are your thoughts? I, I, I couldn't, have, I, I think that, that, that the women who are speaking before me are absolutely right. You have to name whatever it is, you have to name it. And it's been, um, being on the panel, I must thank everybody for, for being here with me. I don't think I did it and, and I do have manners. But one of the things that, that I think we overlook is how long as we have evolved, language has evolved. Mm -hmm. And we, and I say we, because I'm, I'm human and I walk on two legs, but we have been killing people for centuries for the words that they used. And I mentioned Jesus because that's just something that I, I grew up in in, 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 in in that culture, I'm a Christian. But we murdered Jesus, not because he did something, but because he said something. We murdered Socrates, but we also murdered people that we don't know because they tried to tell people, let's look at, we were talking, let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's call this song exactly what it is. We murder people when they find the words that say to other people, this is the change that's needed. And this is the truth that has to be told. We murdered a president. He wasn't all that nice a guy. We murdered John uh, Kennedy, blew his head off. And his wife, I don't know if any of you can see my hand, but Jackie reached out when they, when the bullet shot and she reached down and she carried to the, to the hospital a piece of his skull, which let the doctors know, oh, he's gone. And they had to call it, they had to, to call his death. I'm not saying that Jack Kennedy was, was any great guy. I'm just saying he was listening to the words and people were saying to him, this has to stop. It has to stop that you're shooting us. It has to stop that you're lynching us. It has to stop. And Jack was listening. So we blew his head off. It's very interesting that nobody's blown Donald Trump's head off. It, it, very interesting to me because I think that, that well, they, they always say that if, if you don't know what the devil looks like, it's because you're, you're running with him. That's an old expression. And I think a lot of people don't. Nobody blew his head off, then he has to be the people blowing. He has to be a part of the group that, that are blowing heads off because we're seeing too many people dying. I know you're not supposed to say things like that, but I'm not threatening the president. I'm just saying I'm, 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 I'm amazed that nobody threw his, blew his head off. That's all. Um, on that note, I just want to quickly um, state that we, we are hearing some views, of course, on American politics from Nikki and the others. And I have to just be clear that they don't represent the views of the British Library. So please don't come at the British Library around <laughs> this. I think it's very important. Um, and I, I mean, just again, uh, this is another question around language. Um, but also around definitions, because I think language and definitions are so important when it comes to social justice movements and in trying to frame a lot of what we see. Um, and Naomi asks, how would each of the panelists define feminism and how can you fight for equality and not be a feminist? Um, I want to come to you, Nikki, because you've already said that you, you don't call yourself a feminist. No, and, and I don't because they have made a, it's a, a well as far as I see, and I could be very much wrong, it has become a group, a cult, a thing. And so somebody else said it, but the everyday life that we, that we lead, the everyday things that we have to do, nobody's saying this, this is racist or this is anti-racist. There, there's a book club and it's wonderful. 
uh, and the book that they're reading is uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And so some of the uh, people actually in, in the book club are saying, well, I don't have to be an anti-racist. I don't have to work hard to not be a racist. Well, if you don't, then that means you're a racist and everybody gets upset about that. The racists don't want to admit that, that maybe I am. I, I, I don't, to me, feminism has become a, a club. You, you, you know, you, you, it, it, it's a sorority. You, you can put the clothes on and, and, and get together every Thursday and, and have a drink. It's a club. And un, unless and, and until we're willing, as someone has said, to deal with ourselves. And maybe my world has shrunk. I, I live in a small world. I'm, I'm, I'm just a poet and I'm in a small state and I'm teaching at a small school. But as I see my world shrink, which I don't mind it shrinking, as long as I can at least do whatever it is I think I do. I just, I'm amazed that we're making feminism, the next thing we know, when we get rid of white supremacy, we're gonna be talking about feminism. And it's gonna be like, oh, now we have to deal with that. But it's always gonna be something about white people. It's never gonna be something. And, and I'm glad you have a daughter. I think daughters are really wonderful. <laughs> and and I, I think that, that, I think we don't, we don't let our daughters know how we feel. I know that when our mothers need something, they call us. I know mine did, but we we don't we don't pride we don't pride ourselves. We had a football. We have a football coach here at Virginia Tech. I could not believe he said that. Who was giving an interview after he had called a bad game? Because when the when the team loses, it's a coach's fault. And he would called a bad game, and he said, you know, everybody knows I wanted a son. And I thought, you damn fool, you're sitting there with people who have gone out on a field and gotten injured, somebody running into them. And your response to all of that is everybody knows I wanted a son. That, what kind of sense is that? And so it, 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 it bothers me that we don't let our daughters know how much we value them, what they mean to us, how, how not, not just that we love them because I think daughters probably know they're loved, but, but the value of having a daughter, of having a friend, of having someone uh, my grandmother and I used to cook together of having someone you can make biscuits with. I still can't make biscuits, but I remember grandmother and I, I remember grandmother trying to teach me the value of a daughter. And maybe that's a part of what is also bothering me. I'm not in a particularly bad mood today. It's not one of my better days, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it bothers me that we don't value our daughters. Mm -hmm. That when you have a daughter, nobody says, oh, oh that's a good idea. People yeah. go, oh, sorry well, you didn't have well, a gun. Well, I have to say, you know, in my family, the reason that we are three sisters is because my mum was urged to keep having children so she would have a son. She never had a son in the end. But um, Priyambada, in Indian culture, this certainly is an issue, this kind of son preference in, in a number of cultures, this son preference. Then that aspect of feminism, this is women also wanting sons. This is mothers also wanting sons. How do we kind of fight that? insidious cultural nature of how deep-rooted patriarchy well i mean any any system of injustice requires uh collaboration it also often requires the consent of those uh who are being oppressed so it it in in and not just in india beyond india women are often deeply complicit uh in patriarchy so how do we fight it i think this is the point that any any fight for justice involves and I think this has been said, involves self-reflection, re involves reflection on how we came to be, who we are, and how we can change ourselves alongside other people. Um, so yeah, there is no way, whether it's anti-racism or whether it's feminism, to not look at yourself. I think where I, can, I agree with Nikki is this, I think one of the problems is that feminism uh, in its mainstream incarnation has become that kind of very corporate middle-class white or upper caste lean in feminism, where it is, it does seem often clubbish and it does seem often very narrowly middle class in its interests. I think fighting against patriarchy can't happen alone. It has to happen in conjunction with fights for economic justice, racial justice, sexual justice. Justice. So, so we, we yeah. just we're reaching the end now here. I really wanted to hear from Leila. I'm so sorry that I, I want to very quickly, if you can very briefly just put in your final thought, that would be amazing. Yeah, I just um, 
so I'm thinking about Nikki and how she said she doesn't identify as a feminist. And I think a few years ago, I did identify as a feminist. I don't necessarily now, not because I don't believe in feminism, um, but because in my own analysis of what it means to be a black woman, what it means to be a Muslim woman, right? I'm like, what, so what is my definition of feminism? And what does it mean to me personally? I think it's the same with using the word anti-racist and saying I'm an anti-racist. You know, I don't think that that's a thing that you can be. I think it's a, it's a practice that you can have, but it's not necessarily an identity that is who you are. And so I think feminism is something that I see as a practice. And my definition of it is that it includes all genders, people of all you know abilities, people of all gender identities, and that and people of all races, obviously. Um, and that if it doesn't include everyone, then it's not feminism. Uh, and so that's kind of how I see it, as opposed to something that I identify. It's me. It's something that I think is a practice that based on our, our identities and the way that we're impacted by patriarchy and white supremacy, we'll have a different way of approaching it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to listen to all of you. And I just have to be clear again that the British Library does not endorse the views of individuals contained in this debate, of course. Thank you so much to our wonderful guests and thank you to the audience for tuning in. And again, please do check out the British Library's exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. It's beautiful and thought provoking. And again, my deepest heartfelt thanks to the three wonderful women who are able to join us this afternoon. I'm so grateful to have listened to you. Thank you, um, Angela. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take Thank care. You.